In this segment, we will compare the three approaches and understand which approach makes sense under what circumstances. First, however, we should understand a few basic concepts. Selective versus full risk analysis. Clearly, in scenario analysis, where we are considering three scenarios, worst case, expected case, and best case, here we are doing a selective or a partial risk analysis because we are looking at only three scenarios. At the other extreme, with simulations, we are trying to do a full risk analysis because we consider the distribution of the input variables and we run thousands of simulations so we are trying to do a full risk analysis. With decision trees we try to consider all possible scenarios by converting continuous risk into a manageable set of possible outcomes. In terms of type of risk we need to recognize two dimensions. One dimension is discrete versus continuous and the other is sequential versus concurrent. If we have a situation where risky events can only take one of a few possible values, then we say that we are dealing with discrete risk. On the other hand, if a risky event can take a range of values. So it's a continuum. For example, if you think about evaluating the value of a Home Depot store and we say one of the variables is the base year cash flow. If this base year cash flow can take a whole range of values, then this is continuous risk. The other dimension is sequential versus concurrent risk. If we have a project that is happening in multiple phases, say A, B, and C, and the risks over here depend on what happened earlier, and the risk at phase C depend on what happened earlier, then we are dealing with sequential risk. If the risk does not need to be considered in phases, then we have concurrent risk. And the final point to consider is whether there is a correlation across risks. The risk factors can either be independent of each other or there might be certain risk factors which are correlated. We can now talk about selecting an approach. If we are dealing with discrete risk, the risk elements are independent and we have sequential risk, then decision tree is an appropriate approach. If we have discrete risk, the risks are correlated and concurrent, then scenario analysis makes sense. And this might be slightly tricky. If the risks are correlated, that can be built into the various scenarios. And finally, if we are dealing with continuous risk, then whether the risk elements are correlated or independent, whether they are sequential or concurrent simulations can be used. So a summary here is that if we are dealing with continuous risk, then simulations make sense. If we are dealing with discrete risk, then we could use either decision trees or scenario analysis depending on whether the risks are correlated or not and whether the risks are sequential or concurrent. When selecting an approach, we should also think about the quality of information. Simulations depend heavily on the quality of the input data. So if we are confident about the probability distributions and the parameters that we are using, then simulations make sense. On the other hand, if we don't have a high degree of certainty or high confidence in our input data, then decision trees or scenario analysis would be more appropriate. Generally, when analysts are dealing with new and unpredictable risks, they use scenario analysis.
Here we will talk about whether the three approaches complement or replace the risk adjusted value. So the question is what do we mean by risk adjusted value? Say we are comparing two investments A and B and we want to come up with the value of these investments, the risk and then decide which one is better. To calculate the risk adjusted value we will project the cash flows and if these cash flows are not risk adjusted then we will discount at a rate which does represent the riskiness of each of these investments. So if B is more risky than A then the discount rate for B will be higher. So we are saying that these discount rates do need to be risk adjusted if the cash flow is not risk adjusted then the discounted value that we come up with based on the expected cash flows and the appropriate risk adjusted discount rate is called the risk adjusted value and to decide between A and B we will pick the investment that has the higher risk adjusted value. So notice there is no probability involved here so this approach is a non-probabilistic approach. Now what about the three probabilistic approaches that we've been talking about? Clearly scenario analysis would be a complement to the risk adjusted value because the scenario analysis approach will also tell us what's the worst case scenario or what's the value if the worst case scenario occurs and what's the value if the best case scenario occurs. So that information complements the risk adjusted value. Scenario analysis is not a substitute for risk adjusted value. The reason is that with scenario analysis we still do need that expected value. So in fact part of scenario analysis is to first come up with the expected value or the risk adjusted value based on what we think the various input variables will be. So scenario analysis is not a substitute. Now coming to decision trees. Decision trees can complement risk adjusted value and the decision tree approach can also be a substitute for risk adjusted value. Similarly simulations can complement risk adjusted value and can also serve as a substitute for risk adjusted value. Simulations are a complement in the sense that a simulation will give us a distribution of the output variable which complements the expected value. Why do we say that simulations can also be a substitute for risk adjusted value? If you recall in the Home Depot scenario we came up with a distribution of output values and our simulation software also gave us an expected value that was quite close to the risk adjusted value. So in that sense when we run a good simulation we don't need to calculate the risk adjusted value separately. Now let's say we want to compare A and B and decide which asset to buy. So we run a simulation for the possible values of A and the possible values for B. We are not using a risk adjusted value. We are purely relying on simulations. We get an expected value of A. We get an expected value of B. And let's say these values are the same. We get standard deviations and the standard deviation of B is higher. Then we would say that A is the better investment. But there is an important constraint that needs to be part of these simulations. That constraint is that the cash flows should be discounted at the risk-free rate. The reason we are doing that is our measure of risk is the variability of the output. If we also incorporate risk by using a relatively high discount factor for B, then we are double counting risk which would be a mistake. 